So this is a speaker meeting. Our speaker will share her experience, strength, and hope for approximately 40, 45 minutes. We ask out of respect for our speaker to please remain seated until she has finished. It is my pleasure to introduce Angie. <laughs> everyone, I'm Angie, I'm alcoholic. Hi, Angie. And I have a condition called alcoholism. I hope to convey that message today during my share. Um, I consider myself a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and what that means to me is that I have a sponsor, his name's Rick. Um, I have sponsees in this program. Me and Rick actively work the 12 steps together. Um, he knows about my life. Um, I take certain instructions out of this book with him. I have a home group and a service position and um, I spent many years in this program considering myself a member, but I wasn't actually doing the program of action that was outlined in this big book. Um, and so it's really important to me to not only have a sponsor, but to be sponsorable in this program. Um, I want to congratulate everyone here that's under 30 days of sobriety. I remember how hard it was um, to sit in this chair. And I want to congratulate everyone that picked up birthdays. Um, it's so amazing. Um, and I want to welcome everyone that's from out of town. Um, the greatest thing I ever stole in this program was this big book right here. I have a big book. It says Rogers Unit 5 on the side of it. I stole it in April of 2019. I was in detox for the 13th, 14th, 15th time, something like that. And um, I had been sober in this program before in... Um, really felt uh, just just amazing to be sober and I had almost four years of sobriety and when I left um, when I left that detox with this book I felt like I had you know one gold you know it was in my backpack and I was sneaking out of detox with this book and um, I knew the power that the words on these pages could carry um, and so when I stole this book um, I was certain that I was gonna stay sober I did not um, because to me, this big book, it's an instruction manual for sponsors. And I have to do this program with the fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous. And for a long time, I did this program by myself. And I wanted to figure out how I can do this and stay happy and not drink and, and do all those things on my own. And, and for me and the alcoholism that I had, it just didn't work. Um, so I, I stole this book. I did make amends for it. <laughs> um, I went to detox a second time after that and didn't stay sober after that detox, ended up in detox again. And then they shipped me off to a 30-day program that was um, very big into the 12-step fellowship, but also had some serious sobriety in their therapist. Um, and in their therapist, I could tell that they carried a message of depth and weight, but they also had peace about them that I, I couldn't find myself. Um, when I ended up in that 30 day program, um, and for the love of God, I got to my head just said this, so I'm just going to say this out loud. I got to stop saying, I don't know why I did that or, um, because I do know why, but my head always says that. And so I ended up in this 30 day program and, um, for the first time in my entire life, I knew that I was going to get drunk again. And I'd been to this program before, and every time I sat in that chair and I talked to people in these rooms and I talked to people outside of these rooms, I would say things like, I know what to do to stay sober. I know what I need to do so that I don't have to drink again. If I just get rid of the relationship or maybe if I find a better career and maybe if I go get a college degree, then I, I won't, I'll stop drinking, you know? Um, and for the first time in my life, I conceded to my innermost self that I was an alcoholic and I knew that I was going to get drunk again. And I sat in that 30-day program and I cried my eyes out. Um, everything inside of me was screaming for a drink those first few weeks. And I remember sitting in that, that community meeting and people were talking about gossip and they were talking about um, people stealing things from other people and I got so infuriated and I said, if I have to hear about this for one more minute and I'm about to walk out of those doors and put another drink in my body and I'm gonna have a daughter who's an orphan 
And I got so sick of it. I got so sick of hearing about the petty stuff because I was, everything inside of me was screaming, put a bullet in your head, take another drink. Um, and I went through that 30-day program, and I ended up homeless in this program because if you're living at your parents' house and you're not paying rent, you're homeless. And I was almost... <laughs> And I was almost, you know, 30 years old, almost 30 years old, and I'm back. My alcoholism brought me back to my parents' house. And they were now responsible for my life again. They were responsible for my daughter. They were responsible for uh, my cell phone bill and, and, and everything in life that I, I failed to take responsibility for. Um, I remember walking into my parents' house after that 30-day program, and I could see the fear in my mother's eyes. And she was frantically, frantically trying to keep me busy. Um, she got me up. She took me to the grocery store. I could feel the tension in the house because my alcoholism made everyone walk around on eggshells. And I could see for the first time in my life that not only did my alcoholism start to affect me, but it was affecting everyone else in my life. And I could see that my mom was so scared that her daughter was going to die again. Um, <clears throat> I had ripped away hope from my mother. Um, I took away her sleep. Um, and I wish that I could tell you that I, I picked up a little bit of time in this program and I got happy, joyous, and free right away, but I didn't. Um, I was a couple months sober, and women from alcoholics, and I, oh, God, I got to tell you this story. So I had a, a car with a busted head gasket, and I was driving it about 35 minutes to these meetings in Waukesha, Wisconsin, and, um, oh, God, I just, I was dying to get to those meetings, and um, the car would putter out on the highway, and it would stall out on the side of the road, and everything inside of me was like, just get to the meeting, just get to the meeting, and, um, so my car eventually died, and women from Alcoholics Anonymous came and picked me up and drove me to meetings every single day. And they took me to go meet with their sponsees, and they took me through to big book studies, and um, they took me to various fellowship events. And, um, and I sat in this, and I remember sitting in these chairs, and I was so, um, I was hot on the inside. Um, I was, my body just, it didn't want to sit in that chair. I wanted to get up. I wanted to run away. Um, and I remember these women would come up with, to me and they would be so happy and they'd be like, oh my God, we got a newcomer here. And I'd be like, get the fuck away from me. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, my alcoholism was like seeping out of my pores at these meetings. Um, <coughs> And I was sober a couple months, and I had a sponsor, and we would meet once a week, and she would read the 12 and 12 to me, and then we would meet next week. <laughs> and be, those six days were really painful. I mean, uh, seriously, you guys, like, I'm sober, right? And I, and I can't get in the shower to take a shower. Um, it's painful for me to do dishes. It's painful for me to get out of the bed in the morning. Um, my dad's really angry and wants me to go get a job, and so I'm going out on job search, and um, I, I cannot bring my resume into McDonald's. I'm so crippled with fear. Um, and I would sit in my car, and I would cry, um, and it took everything out of me just to show up to this program. And when I was about two months sober, three months sober, it got so dark in my head. And I think some of you might relate to this. I had a little girl at home, and I'm living at my parents' house. Um, my dad's a Milwaukee police officer. And uh, my alcoholism told me to shoot my daughter and shoot myself. And I'm not drinking anymore. And I don't understand why I want to die. Alcoholism almost killed me and an innocent girl, and I'm not even drinking anymore. If alcohol was my problem, why would I come to a 12-step program? Because if I quit drinking, why can't I be happy? And I tore my dad's basement apart, and I tried to get the gun out of the safe. I'm sp I remember I used to break safes, and I was smashing it on the concrete, trying to get the gun out, and everything. I can't, I can't bear another sober breath. Um, so I pick up the phone, and um, 
at this point, I think I'm a really crappy mother. And I remember this guy at this meeting from like seven years ago. He shared this story about yelling at his daughter. And I don't know why I remembered that story. Of everything this guy has ever shared, I just remember him screaming at his daughter and then wanting to check out. His alcoholism said, nope, not going to be a dad. I'm going to leave. And I pick up the phone and I call him and I say, I think I'm a crappy mom, I, uh, this and that, and uh, complaining about my daughter, and you know, I'm losing my mind, and all this stuff, and I, I asked him for help with parenting, that's why I called him, and he goes, why don't you treat your alcoholism? <laughs> what? <laughs> that's not why I called you. <laughs> and I tell him, you know, I've been sober three or four months, he goes, sober? You mean completely sober? Yes, nothing, <laughs> and nothing in my body. <laughs> um, and um, Without a hesitation, my sponsor, Rick, he just started taking me through the 12 steps. Um, and he started passing along the instructions in the book and um, asking me to join the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous because once again, I'm sitting at home alone and I'm trying to outthink my problems. And life is piling up around me. My emotional natures are, are seeping out of my pores. I have rage and depression and suicidal ideation. And I've been to doctors before. They diagnosed me with everything. I'm bipolar. I have social phobia, I have opiate dependence, alcohol dependence, nicotine dependence, I have insomnia, I have anxiety, depression, all of these things, and they give me all these medications, and it's like, okay, well, I take all the meds, and then I'm on a bag full of medications, and like, then I'm like kind of like teetering on like feeling a little loopy, but it's really not that effective, and so then I start drinking again because, whoo, that medication is the best one you got for me. But it's like, okay, so I have all these things going on. I had no idea that I wasn't suffering from mental illness. I was suffering from untreated addiction, untreated alcoholism. And that the solution for somebody like me was the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had done the 12 steps before, but I hadn't practically applied every instruction in this book to my life. I would go to these meetings and I would say some really cool stuff and I would leave the meeting and I would go be toxic in relationships and uh, steal from my boss, steal from Walmart, and then go make amends to my mom for stealing from her because I'm just not going to steal from my mom anymore. But I'm going to go steal from Walmart later tonight and... Um, I had no idea that, I had no, I had no clue what the nature of alcoholism was. And it's actually outlined right here on page 52. And this is, and, and I hope to convey, I hope none of my opinions come out during this meeting, but just fact check me if you need to. Um, on page 52, it says, we had to ask ourselves why we shouldn't apply our human problems to our human problems, the same readiness to change our point of view. Were we having trouble with personal relationships? Why, yes, I was, every single one. We couldn't control our emotional natures. Rage was seeping from my body. We were a prey to misery and depression. I would have rather put a bullet in my head than been sober. We couldn't make a living. I was unemployable in this program. I got fired from 25 jobs, whether I was sober or drunk. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy, and we couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. That is untreated alcoholism. And so when we go into the doctor's opinion, if you, and, and, and it gives very specific instructions, and if you relate to the doctor's opinion, the doctor says we have to know our own inadequacy when people come to us and they say, please help me, please help me, I can't stop drinking. And the doctor knows that he can't treat alcoholics of our type. That's why every time I sat in a therapy office and I left and I went and did drugs or, you know, drank again, and, and I'm just not understanding why I'm not staying sober after those therapy sessions. That's why every time I put medication in my body to treat the things like bipolar disorder and um, depression and anxiety, I'm, I'm not getting better because I had untreated alcoholism, and you can't treat that with medication and therapy. Unfortunately for me, I've tried. I spent 15 years in doctor's offices. And in the doctor's opinion, it says what you suffer from is a disease. And I personally, this is my opinion, it's, I hyphenate the word dis-ease. It's a body and a mind that is not at ease. And then it goes on to explain that I have a three-part condition. My disease is three parts. The first part is a phenomenon of craving. Well, what's that? I had almost four years in this program. I went to a dentist to have oral surgery, get my wisdom teeth removed. 
absolutely not even one thought of a drink or a drug before I went to that appointment. He prescribed me pain medicine. I had someone in the program hold on to the pain medicine and they fed it to me. When you put the pain medicine in my body, I don't get to decide what happens after that. No matter who's holding on to the pills, what kind of um, people in AA are trying to manage it, I went to that doctor after those pills were gone and I took them for four months. I was working at a treatment center in town carrying a message to other alcoholics sponsoring seven women in this program. I had a home group that I attended every week and I took pain pills for four months without pain and I even had a surgery without any pain. So I had the initial surgery, and then I went to the doctor. I said, oh, it hurts so bad. Oh, he goes, we need to do surgery again. I said, yes, we do. And he gave me more pain pills. And I, had, and I was on pain pills for four months. And I woke up one day, and I was, no, actually, I was, I was sitting outside of Domino's, and I took the pills out of my purse, and I popped them in my mouth, and I was like, oh, shit, I'm getting loaded again. And it didn't even cross my mind. The phenomenon of craving is after I put the substance in my body, the drink, the drug, whatever it is, that drink or drug takes another drink and another drug, and then I become a slave to the drug. The craving has nothing to do with me being sober. What precedes my phenomenon of craving is a mental obsession. I cannot stop thinking about drinking. And I remember sitting at my parents' house desperately trying to make myself be sober. And I would sit there and I would wake up and I would be like, today's the day I'm not going to drink. And I would sit at the clock and I would stare at the TV and I was a zombie on the inside. And I would just, I would watch the minutes on that clock go round and round. And if I can just get to 12 o'clock, then I'll be halfway there. And then I just have to get to dinner and then I just have to get to bedtime. My mind is saying, no, we're not getting loaded today. And my body says, yes, we are. And I would go and I would get loaded again. The mental obsession precedes the craving. What all of that comes down to and what the root of it is, is a spiritual malady. And, and my understanding of a spiritual malady is a separation of my spirit. Some people say it's a separation from me and my fellows. Some people, I mean, there's lots of definitions. I remember having the spiritual malady when I was in middle school. I went to class and I, it was like everyone had this inside joke and I just couldn't understand the joke. I didn't, I felt very different from my fellows. I couldn't connect with people. I felt weird. Um, there was this gaping darkness inside of me and I didn't know what that was. But by the time I started drinking at 14 years old and I felt the effects produced by alcohol, I was like, whoa, man, it lit my insides up like a Christmas tree. You know, I drink essentially for the effects produced by alcohol. I wasn't drinking because I was stressed. I don't take pain pills because I'm in pain. I take them for the effect because it treats my condition in a way that medications for mental health providers don't treat it. Um, and in the doctor's opinion, it gives some really, it, it starts prepping us for some really vital information. And it says, you know, uh, a form of moral psychology is uh, of paramount importance. I'm going to paraphrase and probably mix up a bunch of words, so read it yourself. But, um, you know, it says we have to have an entire psychic change. It also says we have to apply this program to our lives immediately. My time is ticking when I'm in this program between me and the next drink is like, there's no defense. Uh, my sponsor says I have, if I have one voice in my head, I have no choice. If I'm anything, I'm probably schizophrenic, but <laughs> that's another story. Um, I'm always talking to the voices in my head. <laughs> I call it self, it's my alcoholism. It's trying to kill me, um, but it doesn't try to kill me in a, in a, a brutal way, it's very subtle. It's like, ah, oh, don't go to that meeting. Stay in bed today. Don't go to work. Do you really need that job? That's what it says to me. Um, but it says it in there. It starts prepping us for about moral psychology and a psychic change. And what that means is a spiritual experience. It doesn't say into thinking. It doesn't say into feeling. We're going to start going into action. And we have to take certain steps and, and work this program. And I got blessed with really effective sponsorship because we do everything out of this book. We take the instructions in this book. And the greatest thing Rick ever did to me was I would call Rick and I'd be complaining about everyone in my life. And my mother's doing this and he's doing that. And my boss is doing this. And Rick would be like, whoa, I'm not your therapist. He says, if you need a therapist, go to Google 
look one up. I'm not a therapist. When you call me, we're going to take the instructions in this book. And Rick and I started to discuss the nature of my alcoholism. And he helped me to discover, uncover some, some facts about myself. Um, I remember getting offended, you know. Um, there's, there's a part in here where it talks about... Um, in step three, it says uh, selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of my trouble. And in there, it discusses, uh, it says we had to quit playing God. And then we start discussing the roles in which we play God. And we discover that some of the roles in which I play God is called the princess bitch whore. And I'm just saying, um, maybe some of you can relate. <laughs> um, and so um, the princess is the victim. I play that role well. I, I play that role so I can get what I want from other people. The bitch is, I don't need your help. Stay away from me. Leave me alone. This is a role that I play. We're all little actresses and actors. Um, and then the whore is just the seductress. I'll seduce you to get what I want, and there's no relationship with God in, this, in, in these relationships that I have with men. Um, there's also the little spiritual fairy, but that's another story about progression of alcoholism. And um, I remember we were uncovering these roles in which I play God, and it was like I was so offended. I was like, oh, how dare, I can't believe this. And Rick goes, I'm not offending you. I'm offending your alcoholism. And I was like, what? I'm not my alcoholism? And I started to contemplate that there's something in me that gets offended and it's not me the fuck is it <laughs> can I observe it no I'm not going to go down that path but um, <laughs> um, so then the steps and roll you know the and I remember I called Rick and I was like complaining about my daughter and like oh my god I cannot believe the sad state of her life and everything that's wrong with her and Rick goes you're not worried about her you're worried about yourself and I was like you got to be kidding me. <laughs> um, and it was true. I had this subtle selfishness about me that I couldn't see. You see, the best thing about sponsorship is that we get to problem solve my life together. And, I, and we get to see things that I cannot see left up to my own unaided devices. This book is for sponsors. These instructions are for sponsors to, to take people through the steps. Um, and so we get to the four step and Rick kept saying, when you're ready, when you're ready, when you're ready, when you're ready, when you're ready on the phone. And I'd be like, all right, whatever. And then call him and complain again, you know, about everything that's not changing in my life. Um, and we get to the four step. And um, I remember one day I was, I went to bed and I was just suffering. And I said, what do you mean when you say when you're ready? He goes, then we're going to take a moral inventory. Okay, when do I know if I'm ready? I don't know. You'll let me know when you're ready. And then I think a few days later, I said, okay, I'm ready. And he goes, three to five resentments. Here's the format. And I had to follow the format. And, like, I got to just touch on this for a second. Following directions is not my strong suit. I have rebellious defiance. Um, I don't even know what you would describe it. It's defiance. Um, growing up, parents would give me a set of instructions, not doing it just because you told me to. I remember my parents telling me, and this is kind of like a six and seven little metaphor, but my parents would go make me weed the garden with those little shears or whatever. God, I'd get so mad. I hated weeding the garden. And they'd be like, you have to pull the, the weed out of the ground by the root. You got to get the root out of the ground. I ain't pulling the, and they, they would say, it's going to grow back if you don't get it out by the root. Well, I would go out there with the shears and just be so mad and just, you know, just start chopping it up and stabbing the ground with the scissors and things like that. I would never pull the, I'd never pull the weed up by the roots. So the, the weeds kept growing back and I kept having to go out there and continuously get those weeds. And that's just like my alcoholism is like, um, never getting to the root of it. Um, treating symptoms like feelings and things like that but never getting to like the real root of the nature of alcoholism um and so my sponsor calls step four spiritual surgery um prepping a patient to see the cancer in which is alcoholism um and so um Oh, I was, oh, defiance, yeah. So unmanageability, how I manage my life. I remember I, I went to college for three years while I was drinking. I have no credits. Um, 
oh, you think it's funny? It wasn't funny at that time. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, I got to make something of myself, right? I got to be somebody. I got to, you know, I just got to show the world <laughs> I can just stop drinking if I just get that college degree. And, um, you know, I went to college and I was like, okay, I'm going to let college manage me, right? That's not the language I used back then, but that's essentially what I was attempting to do. I was going to let college manage my alcoholism. And I went in every semester and it's like, what are you supposed to do in college? Well, be a good student. What does that look like? Well, I have to show up to class early. I have to do the homework, pay attention in lecture, ask questions, take notes, study for the test or the quiz, all these things. I would get about a week or two into class and I would be like, you're not going to manage me like that. And I'd walk out of class. And I would repeat that insanity semester after semester. I even changed degrees thinking that that would, you know, I'm going to be an architect. That was what I went for first. I was going to be an architect. Then I changed it to nursing. Then I changed it to just being a CNA. And I was like hoping that if I just changed what I was going to school for, it would motivate me to stay there. My alcoholism doesn't want to stay there. It doesn't want to be managed. And nothing, and it talks about that in the big book, is like nothing could manage my alcoholism. Not me, not my parents, not judges, not police officers. And finally, it couldn't be managed by God. I have a very unmanageable condition. Um, and so we get to the four step and... I've uncovered some roles in which I play God. And in the four step, I mean, oh my gosh, there's so much information in here. Um, we launched on a course of vigorous action. Hmm. The first step is personal house cleaning. And then it says our liquor was but a symptom. We had to get down to causes and conditions. So we get the, the four step and I write down the person I'm resentful at and I write down the cause, right? And it's very simple. What did they say? What did they not say? What did they do? What did they not do? Um, you define the, the role of the relationship. And then um, how we did it was we went through seven areas of self and like just to give some, and this is just for the women in the room, but maybe it's a man's inventory. I'm not sure. I don't typically work with men in the program, but um, as far as like a woman's inventory, it's like, so like you can, I can put down the person's name, right? And like, let's just use like X's for an example. And then I, I list all the things that, you know, is wrong with everyone I've ever dated, right? These are the amends that you guys owe me, you know, how you've wronged me. How dare you do this to me? And then you get down to seven areas of self and it's like self-esteem. It's like, how is self-esteem affected? Well, I am the greatest girlfriend you've ever had in your entire life. And then pride says, um, you should see that I'm the greatest girlfriend you've ever had in your entire life. And then ambition, my selfish want as a result of this resentment. I want all of your time and attention, right? And then security is, I need all of your time and attention. And then you go into these different roles and so, personal relations is like uh, you define the the role of of you know let's say boyfriends just for this example and so it's like real boyfriends should do what I want when I want them to do it that's self right we're talking about self the cancer and that's not a relationship that's imprisonment I didn't even know that the love that I tried to give other people was conditional because I didn't know the definition of condition. I thought I loved unconditionally. I didn't. I didn't even know what love was because every area of my life was driven by selfishness and self-centeredness. And then you get down to, you know, um, the realization and you know it's fun because there's a lot of instructions in here and I feel like a lot of people get stuck on this one part where it says like um, where is it oh you know we, we find out the other person is sick right and that's as far as we get most of us are like yeah I'm dealing with sick people <laughs> that's my problem <laughs> you know um, but the book says that's not, that's not, that's not where this ends. That's not where the fourth step ends. And so referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done us, we resolutely looked for our own mistakes. And the realization, my sponsor goes, what was it like for them to have to date you? What do you mean? 
What was it like for them to have to date you? I had, I never looked at my relationships from the perspective of other people. It was always about how you affected me. It was never about other people. What was it like for your mother to be your mother while you were drinking? What was it like for your boss? All 25, all those bosses you hate, the 25 that fired you, what was it like for them to have to employ you? The stress you caused because you wouldn't come to work anymore and you're tired and you're overworked, blah, blah. And you know, your boss has to go overtime. They have to go in, they have to take over your shift, they have to do your job, they have to do their job. Then they have to go hire somebody and hope for the best because they just freaking had to correct all your mistakes because you were probably stealing from the cash register. At least I was. You know, um, and it was my boss's fault. I didn't have the right boss. <laughs> That's why I have these problems. So I had to look at this from a new perspective, and that perspective was, what was it like for all those people? Well, I mean, every guy I ever dated had to walk around on eggshells around me because I was so angry, and I tried to control you, and I never let you have your own freedom. And there was a, a gut-wrenching feeling in my stomach thinking about what it was like for other people to have to deal with me. The book talks about a psychic change. And it's like we get into this program and it's like there's, there's certain suggestions that were asked, you know. It's like um, and like some of it is like there's certain things that were suggested and um, I lost my train of thought. Maybe it's going to go away. Maybe it's going to come back any day now. Ding, ding, ding. Nope, maybe not. Um, it's like, okay, and this is, okay, so this is my experience. It's like I gave up, I, I ended up in Alcoholics Anonymous with nothing once again, right? Alcoholism, it can manage and build up my life, and then it lights it on fire within 30 seconds. And so that huge life that I tried to build for self, right? I was going to make a name for myself. I build it up from the ground up and then just light a match and peace, you know, there it goes. Um, but it's like we give up certain things and I ended up in this program with nothing. The relationship was gone. My parents couldn't stand me. I couldn't be a good mother. I don't have a job anymore. Um, and it's like, what else is there left to give? Well, the psychic change says, give up your personality. Yikes. I have to give up everything that I think I know about myself in this program, including that little seductress, you know, that little bitchy attitude that I think is funny, you know. I have to give up everything in this program. It says in this, it says we tried to hold on to some of our old ideas and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. And so I work through this, these four-step inventories, and I keep getting sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker because I'm swallowing and digesting some big truths of ch big chunks of truth about myself, not other people. I'm not digesting truth about understanding you better. I'm understanding me better in the nature of alcoholism that lives inside of me and the reactions that it creates in my life. And then somewhere in here, I don't know exactly where it is. It says, we, we looked back to the list for it held the key to our freedom. And then I look back at the resentments, and it's like, how have you done that stuff? <sighs> got to be kidding me. So I look at the, what I hate about you. And then I have to ask myself, how have I done those things? And now that four step becomes an eighth step. <laughs> And all that stuff that I hate about you becomes my amends to the world. And if you're like me, and you stayed sober in this program for a long time, maybe you got amended and maybe you didn't. I was almost four years sober. I was not amended in this program because I kept swallowing truths about you and not of myself. And I had some wonderful experiences. I got connected with an amazing fellowship of women. These meetings didn't keep me sober. That fellowship didn't keep me sober. There was some serious work that needed to be done inside of me. And that's what they talk about in the doctor's opinion about that moral psychology and that psychic change. A medication couldn't have done that to me. And so we, we looked back at that list 
for it held the key to my freedom. And all of a sudden, I'm going into the practice field. And my sponsor said, you know, you know, how does Kobe Bryant get good at playing basketball? He spends more time in practice than at the game. He's practicing for the game. And that's what it talks about in the doctor's opinion by applying. We have to apply this to our lives immediately, not tomorrow, not when we feel like it, not when the timing is right. We have to do it now. And I felt this urgency inside of me because I'm getting so sick. And what happened through that inventory is I started to practice this under, I guess, this awareness of character defects. I could be aware of character defects. And I remember I was sitting with a group of coworkers and we're all talking shit about my boss. And I'm starting to feel, sh I'm starting to feel sick sitting in there participating in that to the point where I can no longer participate in talking about my boss anymore. Um, we started writing the eighth step. And just because we write the eight step does not mean we're going to make amends. <laughs> I had to learn that the hard way. But um, I had to practice what was on that eight step list. list and, and it, you know, you go through all the harm that you cause those people. And what my eight step looked like before was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I kept getting loaded. And that's the reason why I did all the things that I did. And, you know, I'm just going to stay sober this time and have better boundaries with you. Um, that's not an, that was not an eight step. It wasn't a thorough eight step. It was like, I had to take full responsibility for my alcoholism and what it was doing to you. So I lied to you. I cheated to you. I blamed you. I screamed at you. I made you responsible for my entire life. I took out my PMS on everyone. I had to take responsibility for that. You know, that was the nature of alcoholism was the, all those defects of character that I was operating my life under. Um, so we write out the eight step and this one was a doozy, man. This one was long. It was like, here's the harm. This is how it made you feel, you know? So I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm really feeling like, like putting myself in your shoes and really thinking about what it was like for you to have to deal with me and then my amends and, and, and the actions I'm going to take to correct it. And it's like, you know, some of that stuff takes time, but then you go into the practice field and you got to practice these, these behaviors in all your affairs. And some of it was like, you know, I didn't have really good, I didn't have good behaviors in relationships. And I had to go to women's meeting and I had to ask them, how did you guys change these behaviors? And I had to walk with different women through taking different actions and, um, correcting those behaviors. I had to learn how to be employable in this program. That means when I go to work, it's not like go to work and do 200% because you got to make something of yourself anymore. It just means go to work and do your job. Just do your job. That's all they want. But I have this ego inside of me that says I need to be the best of the best and I'm going to get promoted and they're going to promote me in 30 seconds and I'm going to be the CEO of this company and make $100,000 a year and that's what it's telling me to do. That's what self is telling me to do. And like part of like being employable was like just do your job, Angie. Slow and steady because what happens? I, over, I, get, I overwork myself trying to be an overachiever and then I get burnt out and I can't even show up to the job anymore. I do that stuff sober. When your boss gives you a 15 minute break, it means 15 minutes, not 37 minutes, you know? And I share this stuff all the time, but it's like, I, I literally had to learn how to be employable in this program. I learned, how, I had to learn how to dress appropriately. <laughs> um, I remember going to a baby shower with my friend Chelsea and she picked me up and I looked, I looked like I came out of a trap house with my... <laughs> My sweatpants, I mean, I'm not even a dude, and I was wearing sweatpants, like sla slagging sweatpants past my foot. And uh, she told me to go in the house and change. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Um, but I had to learn how to, like, dress appropriately in this program. And um, what started to happen is, like, my character started to change, you know. And, and this is just a, a little fun fact, but when I took the Myers-Briggs personality chart back in the day, I was always the debater, the 3%. I would argue with you for the fun of arguing. I don't even really have a, I don't have any weight in one side of the, uh, uh, the argument or not. I just like messing with you and making you mad and getting reactions out of you, right? Um, and so my personality was the debater and I was in a psychology class last semester and I had to take that, that same exact thing. 
and I don't even have the same personality anymore as a result of this program. There was a lot that had to be changed about me. Um, and so I went through spiritual surgery. Steps four through eight was probably the hardest. Making amends amended is actually pretty cool. The fear goes away and you're not even scared to go make the amends because your behavior actually changed before you sat down with that person to make that right with them. And so at that point, it's like, it was like, I was willing to take the consequences for my actions. It's like, if I have to walk into a jail cell today, I'm not scared of that today. And it's not because I'm cocky or anything like that. It's because I'm 100% ready to take responsibility for the things that I have done as a result of untreated alcoholism, which has, and my sponsor said this a couple days ago, but it's like, my sponsor goes, I have alcoholism. It has nothing to do with my last drink 38 and a half years ago. And that resonates with me because I have this voice in my head called self and I'm self-reliant. And every time that voice tells me to do something, I do it. Not even a thought in my head. And these, this book gives me very simple instructions, you know. It says, you know, we ask God for inspiration, intuitive thought, or a decision. We pause when agitated or doubtful. Oh, man, pausing is such a hard thing for someone that has alcoholism like me. But we practice that in this program. And, you know, and then you get on through the four step. It's like you get into the sex inventory and it asks you all these questions. And then you subject each relationship to this test. Was it selfish or not? And then it says, you know, we take certain actions. We ask God to mold our ideal, which means I don't get to be in charge of my sex relations anymore. God is. I ask God for inspiration, intuitive thought, or a decision about, about my employment, about my relationships, what he would have me do, if I should take that class or not. And you guys might think that that's like, ooh, that's too much. But I have alcoholism, and like I almost put a bullet in a three-year-old's head as a result of untreated alcoholism. Like there's a serious fire burning inside of me to find a relationship with a God that didn't just keep me sober, but restored me to sanity. You know when I go to a doctor, I have not been to a doctor in years and got medication for any type of depression or anything like that. And that's because of the 12-step program. In step 10, it says we, we've got placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We haven't even sworn off. That's the blessing of this program. I get placed, I get restored to balance, restored to sanity. I'm neutral. I'm not pushing alcohol away. I'm not trying to keep it close or substances. I'm not doing that with relationships. I'm not pushing them away or trying to keep them close. Safe and protected from my alcoholism. My alcoholism wakes me up every morning. I have to take certain steps as soon as I wake up in the morning. Just like, um, what is it, the insulin thing? The insulin. Spiritual insulin. So a diabetic, my friend Chelsea, she has diabetes. She has type 1 diabetes. She's had it for a long time. Um, so she has to wake up every morning. She has to check her blood sugar. She has to take a certain medication. She has to follow a certain diet. If she doesn't do that, she ends up in the hospital. If she continues to not check her blood sugars, take the medication, eat healthy, she will end up in a coma and she will die. She has to take certain actions every single day to monitor her blood sugar, and she has to do it multiple times a day. I have the same thing with alcoholism. It talks to me through my head and my thoughts. It doesn't tell me to drink. It's very selfish and self-centered. It wants me to think more about me. So when I wake up in the morning and I have that thought, think about yourself, Angie, and whatever it says, oh, you're not going to work today or whatever. I have to center self or I become self-centered. I have to do that multiple times a day. Multiple times a day. If I don't do that, my alcoholism goes into effect. I start taking certain actions to my alcoholism and I end up in what the book says, jails, institutions, and death. I end up insane in this program. And I treat my insanity with a drink. I didn't get all the way through the steps, but I did want to read this on page, I think it's 317. The program has spiritual principles in each step. 
those principles are non-negotiable with my alcoholism throughout the day. So like things like being honest, they're non-negotiable with my head. I had to practice being honest. I remember calling my sponsor. He goes, did you write your story? Yes, I wrote my story. And I had to call him back and I said, what I just told you was a lie. Because it's, I'm powerless. I mean, I, I'm serious, you guys. Alcoholism is, it's ingrained inside of me. <laughs> like, the, a lie will come out of my mouth. And I wasn't planning on lying. I had to practice being honest, being genuine, being authentic. So these principles, the principles is the foundation for sanity. Okay, let me just find this real quick. Sobriety is nothing like I thought it would be. At first, it was one big emotional roller coaster full of short, sharp highs and lows. My emotions were new, untested, and I wasn't entirely certain that I wanted to deal with them. I cried when I should have been laughing. I laughed when I should have cried. That's not what I was trying to read. Um, <laughs> maybe it's not important. Following the principles laid out in the big book has not always been comfortable, nor will I claim perfection. I have yet to find a place in the big book that says, now you have completed the steps, have a nice life. The program is a plan for a lifetime of daily living. There have been occasions when the temptation to slack off has won. I view each of these as a learning opportunity. I didn't graduate the 12 steps, I never will. I commenced this way of living because I had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps and I like to stay on the firing lines and carry that message to other alcoholics. My life is not perfect. I have tons of feelings, emotions, and things like that. I use the 12 steps for everything in my life. Thank you for letting me be a part of your sobriety. <laughs> Let's thank Angie one more time.